So today we'll begin Chapter 7, Part 1. These are pages 231 to 246 in your textbook. We'll be focusing today on the process of transcription. These next two lectures, all of Chapter 7, really cover how the information in DNA is turned into protein, how it's decoded to build a protein. But today we'll just talk about the first step of that process, which is transcription. We'll begin the lecture talking about transcription in general, so just so everybody has an overall understanding of what transcription is. We'll move on to the different types of RNA that a cell can make and why a cell makes those RNAs. We'll talk about promoters, which are the starting points of transcription. And we'll also discuss in that conversation how transcription begins, how it's initiated by the cell. We'll wrap up today's lecture talking about these interesting little segments of DNA called introns. Introns need to be removed from newly transcribed RNA, and that's through a process called splicing. So even if you're not a uh, educated biologist, all you really have to do is take one good look at DNA and understand its structure to realize that it must be the heritable material of life. It contains all of the information needed to be self-replicated. Uh, it contains all of the information needed to be copied. And it also is an information storing molecule. Its sequence conveys and contains information. Crick and Watson in their seminal paper, which describe the structure of DNA, um, ended that paper with this quote. I, I love this quote. I think it's probably one of the largest understatements of the century. Remember, please keep in mind that this quote is describing probably the most important discovery that science has ever made. This is Watson and Crick. It has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing we have postulated immediately suggests a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material. It has not escaped their notice. I love that. Um, obviously, the structure of DNA says in its own structure how DNA is copied, and copying is the most important requirement for genetic material. So DNA certainly is the heritable material of life. Here's our central dogma. DNA can be replicated, it can be repaired, it can undergo recombination. We've talked about all that already. But to manifest or use the information contained in DNA, it must be transcribed or copied into a molecule of RNA. That RNA is then decoded through the process of translation to build a protein, and it's the proteins that matter to the cell. So fairly simple experiments done in the 60s, in the early 60s, conclusively show that segments or portions of DNA sequences on chromosomes contain the information for building proteins. And remember, it's really the proteins that are important. Proteins are what do everything in the cell. If a cell is carrying out an individual cellular function, that function is being carried out by proteins. For protein, structure equals function. What we mean by this is it's the three-dimensional shape of the protein that allows it to do the job that it does. The importance of the sequence of, amino of amino acids is that that three-dimensional shape that a protein folds into is determined by its amino acid sequence. So particular amino acid sequences fold into particular three-dimensional shapes. So the underlying information for what shape a protein should fold into is contained by the amino acid sequence. Where did that amino acid sequence come from? Well, it was decoded from the sequence of the RNA. Where did that sequence come from? The sequence of the DNA and the gene for that protein. So the DNA sequence of nucleotides allows you to copy an RNA of the same sequence. That RNA dictates a sequence of amino acids. That amino acid sequence dictates how the protein is going to fold. And that folding is what gives its protein its function. So indeed, it's the sequence of nucleotides in the DNA that carry the information for cellular processes. Now, in eukaryotic cells, one single gene contains the information for building one protein. And you'll see near the end of the lecture that that's kind of sort of true, but not definitely true. But in the most part, that's what we say. So what that means is if the need for a particular protein arises in the cell, and that could be an expected need or not, environmental changes occur dynamically, and the cell has a need for a new protein to contend with that change, or the cell is in some developmental program, and so a new protein is needed to carry on development of the organism, whatever the cause might be, the cell needs a new protein that it didn't need before. So what it needs to do is activate the particular region of DNA on a chromosome which contains the instructions for building that protein, and that's a gene. The first step of that activation is that the gene has to be copied into an RNA, and this is the process of transcription.
These RNA molecules, they're just nucleic acids, very much like DNA. We've actually already discussed some of the differences between RNA and DNA. So RNA molecules are chains of nucleic acids, the same as DNA is. What that means is the information hasn't yet been changed. It hasn't yet been decoded. We're not in the language of proteins yet. But it's the RNAs that are directly used for protein synthesis. The process of making a protein from an RNA molecule is translation. We won't talk about translation today. That'll be the next lecture. So please keep in mind the central dogma as we go through all of this information. All the central dogma does is describe a flow of information. The flow of genetic information begins with DNA. It flows to and through RNA, culminating in a built protein. So the question here becomes, why? Why go through this two-step process? Why not just build proteins from DNA and be done with it? Especially if RNA really isn't changing anything. Well, the analogy here is simply just content of information, or, or, or more accurately, amount of information. Let's say I came to you, and I asked you to describe to me the obscure little town in England called Wrexham. I'm doing a paper for some history class, and I need to know some information about the town in England called Wrexham. You could, especially in the old days, bring me this. You guys don't use these anymore, but these are encyclopedia. Uh, individual volumes of a full encyclopedia. So you could bring me this and say somewhere in this information is uh, Wrexham and what you need to write your paper. And I would say to you, you know, thanks, but no thanks. That's about 150 pounds of information there, and I just need information on Wrexham. If you were nicer, a little bit more accommodating, a little bit of a better friend, you could go to your encyclopedia and photocopy this page. You could photocopy the single page that has information on Wrexham. And then you can bring me that photocopied page, and I would be extremely grateful. I'd be grateful for two reasons. You've provided me with the information that I need, and you've done it in a very usable, portable format that's convenient for me to use. This is the point of the central dogma. The genome contains all the information that a cell could possibly ever need. The genome, the DNA genome of the organism, is the encyclopedia. All the information is there, and all the information must be stored. So this, it con the genome contains the information for doing everything, but it's mostly too much information. The cell doesn't need all this information all the time, just as, though, just as I didn't need the ency en entire encyclopedia. That single photocopied page is analogous to the messenger RNA, the mRNA, that's made through transcription. Ah, this is the convenient form. This is the single copied piece of information that I needed at that time. I don't need the full encyclopedia. I need the page on Wrexham. I don't need the entire genome. I just need my gene for the protein that I need right now. The RNA that is made through transcription, it's small. It's portable. It's usable. It's convenient. It's the single piece of information that's needed at that time. So how do we do that then? How do we transcribe DNA into RNA? And more importantly, how do we transcribe only genes? How do we know the genes that we need and know how to transcribe them? When the information that's contained within a DNA gene has been manifested, and what we mean is just brought to fruition, when it's been used. In the case of protein coding genes, that means the gene has been manifested as a protein. A protein's been made. But when any gene has been used for its purpose, we say that the gene has been expressed. So gene expression means DNA genes being used for the purpose they were in the genome for. Many identical copies of an RNA molecule can be made from a single DNA gene. And then from single RNAs, many identical proteins can be made. So we have this process of amplification occurring, where a single gene on a double-stranded piece of DNA can be copied and copied and copied and copied into multiple identical RNAs. This is as though you went to your encyclopedia, found the one and only page that refers to Wrexham, but made a photocopy for me and my friend and my group member and my mother and everyone else who needs a copy of that information to help me with my report. They're identical copies of the single piece of information that was in the encyclopedia. Then, 
since the RNA is only going to be used as a guiding template for building a protein, many, many proteins can be made from each RNA. In this case, we're making five proteins from each RNA molecule that was transcribed. So we have five RNAs made from a single gene, five proteins made from a single RNA, so here we've made 25 proteins from this single gene. That is amplification. Amplification allows a cell to respond very potently and rapidly to any change or need. So if a cell gets hit with very high heat and it needs these heat shock proteins which allow it to survive very quickly, the cell need only to activate a single gene to make hundreds if not thousands of identical heat shock proteins to survive, to survive that heat shock. Now keep in mind amplification is not a necessity. This is a luxury that cells can use. There's nothing stopping a cell from making just one single RNA copy from a gene and then building one single protein from that RNA. Cells don't need to amplify their response. It's just possible. So the amount of protein needed by a cell should and does match the need. The amount of gene expression dictates how much protein is going to be made and the amount of protein made matches the need of the cell. This is achieved through regulation. Gene expression is regulated at multiple steps and we'll begin talking about gene regulation after the first exam. So before we move on, let's just describe the terms transcription and translation in a little bit more detail and, and do it in a way that you don't have to memorize but simply understand. Transcription outside of the realm of biology has a very distinct meaning. This woman in this cartoon is transcribing. What she's doing is she's listening to spoken words in English, presumably, and she's typing them onto her computer in English. In transcription, the language is the same. The motto of the transcriptionist is, you speak, we type. They're hearing English and they're typing English. They might be changing the form that the information is in, from spoken sound to written word, but they're not changing the language. Translation means something different. When you translate language, you go from one language to another. This is the Beethoven song, Ode for Joy, translated from German into English. Here the language changes. Google Translate also does that. So translation means going from one type or form of information to a completely different form. So when we say we transcribe a DNA gene into RNA, the implication is, accurately, that the language stays the same. See, DNA and RNA both speak the language of nucleic acids or nucleotides. So when you go from DNA to RNA, you don't change that language. You are transcribing that information, you're changing its form, but you're not changing its language. RNA is very similar to DNA. RNA is a linear polymer made up of only four nucleotides that are held together in five prime to three prime chains by phosphodiester bonds. Uh, that sentence could just as easily describe DNA. We'll talk about it more in the next lecture, but when you translate from RNA to protein, that's when you're going from the language of nucleotides to the language of amino acids. That's a completely and radical change, and it takes a little bit more of a complex cellular process to do that. But back to RNA and DNA. There are actually only a few differences between RNA and DNA, and we've talked about some of them already. One for sure we already know, and it's shown here by these red arrows. DNA has been deoxified. That 2' prime hydroxyl that we see on the ribose sugar of RNA is deoxyribose in DNA. And that 2' prime hydroxyl is now a proton. It's now a hydrogen. That's the main difference between the two. Also, in RNA, there is no thymine. RNA has uracil, the base uracil, in place of thymine. So there's no T in RNA. There's a U instead. Everything else you know about T is the same. Uracil base pairs with adenine. So U takes the place of T, but there are no thymine bases in RNA. Probably most importantly, biologically, RNA is usually single-stranded, whereas DNA is always double-stranded. This single-stranded nature of RNA allows for what is called intramolecular base pairing. That means a single RNA strand can base pair with itself. And this allows for some pretty funky three-dimensional shapes that RNA can take. 
These are some examples. The one on the left is stupid. I don't know why they made it look like a person. I, that bothers me a little bit. But the point here is that this is a single RNA strand. Uh, we start, we'll say this for, arbit for um, argument's sake, is the 5 prime end. So this RNA starts at the 5 prime end, and this is a single RNA strand going all the way around in this silly shape and coming here at the 3 prime end. But because some of these se sequences are, are complementary, this G can base pair with this C, this U can base pair with this A, this A with this U, this U with this A. And so there is base pairing within the single molecule. This causes the RNA to take a three-dimensional shape. The same is the case here. And this is a much better diagram for what happens the same as the case here. So these single strands of RNA base pair with, its, with themselves, in essence, and form these three-dimensional folded shapes. DNA can't do this. The reason DNA can't do this is because DNA is always double-stranded. There are no single unpaired bases in DNA that are free to engage in intramolecular base pairing. And so DNA doesn't fold into three-dimensional shapes. And we'll come back to this in the next lecture, but where there is three-dimensional shape, there is function in a cell. That's why proteins are what they are, biological machines, because they have three-dimensional shapes. RNAs having three-dimensional shapes can have function as well. But again, we'll come back to that in a little bit more detail in the next lecture. So this brings up a really interesting observation, something that we've also discussed before. We start with DNA, we transcribe DNA into RNA, and from RNA we can translate proteins. That is the central dogma. DNA is great for what it does. It's an excellent information storing molecule. It is extremely stable, but it is static. DNA sits there. It really doesn't do much. Lots of things are done to DNA, but DNA itself really doesn't do anything at all. Proteins are amazing. They are catalytic. They are machines. They make biochemical processes happen at amazing rates. They're dynamic. They move around. They're regulated. They're changed. They're modified. It's just amazing. But proteins are information empty. Proteins can and will never be self-replicating. Proteins do not and will not ever contain the information within themselves to be copied. So you can think of DNA and protein as highly specialized molecules that are exceptionally good at what they do and exceptionally awful at anything else. DNA stores information amazingly, but as a biomolecule for doing anything, it's completely useless. Proteins are amazing biomolecules for doing anything, but they're one-shot deals. They can't replicate themselves. So if you make a single protein and it does a job great and then it breaks down, you can't make another with just the protein. RNA, RNA is in between these two. RNA can store information because it's sequences of nucleic acid. But RNA is not as stable as DNA. It's more prone to breaking down. But RNA can fold into three-dimensional shapes. And where there's shape, there's function. And when there's function, there's catalysis. But RNA is not really the best cat uh, catalyst out there. Proteins are much, much better. So RNA is pretty good at information storing, but not great. RNA is pretty good at catalysis, but not great. But RNA is the only molecule known to life that is capable of these two things. What that means is that it was an RNA world. Life on this planet began with molecules of RNA that were sometimes static, but pretty good at storing information, sometimes dynamic, and pretty good at catalyzing reactions. But they could do both simultaneously. And again, that's the RNA world hypothesis. This idea that's probably soon to become law, that life, and even pre-life, simply biomolecules, organized events on this planet, began with RNA. Alright, but enough of all that. So let's talk about transcription itself. The end result of transcription should be an RNA strand which is complementary to the DNA strand of the gene for that RNA. Transcription is the only way a cell has to make RNA. So RNA, regardless of its purpose or function, is made by cells through transcription. And if you understood replication well enough, then transcription should be fairly easy to comprehend. The processes are very similar. Transcri transcription begins with unwinding the double helix of DNA
and separating two strands near a gene to make those two strands single-stranded. This is happening five prime of, upstream of, or in front of a gene. So in this schematic we see, well, disregard the details for now, but we see double-stranded DNA near a gene, and the very first step of transcription is pulling those two strands apart, creating an open bubble. That looks familiar. And then you're going to make a copy of one of those strands, using it as a template strand, and make that copy using the rules of base pairing. Well, that also sounds familiar, very much like replication. So the one DNA strand that's used to make an RNA is used as a template strand. And again, the rules of base pairing are adhered to. So here we get a little bit of a closer look inside that transcription bubble. Again, this is transcription. We see the two DNA strands have been separated, and one of those strands is being used as template. The rules of base, pair are, base pairing are being followed, and the only catch here is here's an adenine in the template strand, and what is put across from it for the RNA? Uracil, not thymine. Other than that, these are concepts we should be very comfortable with. Now we're making RNA, so we're using NTPs, we're using nucleotide triphosphates. Specifically, we're using ribonucleotide triphosphates, not DNTPs, not deoxynucleotide triphosphates, because we're making RNA. There's been no deoxification here. <laughs> but in any event, these NTPs, these ribonucleotides, are being added one by one to form a 5' prime to 3' prime chain of RNA that is complementary to the template DNA strand. The newly formed RNA molecule is referred to as a transcript because it was made and copied through transcription. Here are the differences with replication. The newly made RNA strand doesn't stay base paired with the DNA. This is a temporary process. In fact, as soon as the polymerase machinery, as soon as the enzyme responsible for making RNA passes, the DNA closes up behind it. So you can see this open transcription bubble continues along with the process as a wave. You probably remember in replication, we would end with two brand new DNA molecules coming out of the bottom, the back of the DNA polymerase. That's not the case here. The DNA is opened in a very localized region, allowing one strand to be used as template strand, but that DNA zips right back up again to double strand the DNA behind the moving polymerase. So this is like a wave of transcription, a moving transcription bubble uh, that goes along the DNA. Second, the RNA copies are um, much shorter than full chromosomes, obviously, because the genes are just segments or regions of the DNA. The enzymes responsible for transcription are called RNA polymerases because they make RNA polymers. They catalyze the formation of phosphodiester bonds between ribonucleotide subunits, making a phosphate sugar backbone of RNA, very much like we've seen with DNA. So here is a very general schematic of that. You see your phosphate sugar backbone, as we've seen it before. The bases are projecting outwards. Here we see the base uracil because we're dealing with RNA. Just like DNA replication, the energy needed to power this process comes from the NTPs themselves. NTPs stand for ribonucleotriphosphates. Triphosphates. So remember, those are high energy bonds between those phosphates. To link this base onto a chain of RNA, we would have to cleave this bond right here. And that bond contains a great deal of, of energy, and that energy would power this process forward. Because the RNA is only associated with the template strand of the DNA in that very localized transcription bubble, we can actually have multiple RNA polymerases transcribing a gene simultaneously. They're like uh, tractor trailers on a highway, one right in front of the other, riding each other's bumper. And that's shown here. Here the direct, dr direction of transcription is from right to left. So the RNA polymerase we see here closest to the left has been at the process for the longest. So it has the longest RNA strand made. This guy's just started the process, and so his strand is the smallest. But all these RNA polymerases are marching from right to left, transcribing DNA as they go. And when each of them end the gene, they'll all have made the same RNA molecule. This is a true electron micrograph of the same process. Beautiful, beautiful structure. It looks like palm frond, some kind of leaf. But what we are seeing is this very same process of simultaneous transcription by multiple RNA polymerases. This thick, dark line in the center, that's the DNA. And these little kind of wavy lines that are thinner coming off of it, 
are the RNA molecules that are made from transcription. On the ends of these RNAs are proteins that bind to the 5' prime end of the RNA molecule. So it kind of puts a point on the end, a little dot on the end of each of those molecules. Uh, here we see short RNA molecules, and closer to the end of the gene we see molecules that are much, much longer. So this is a single gene we see here, from here to here. And we see multiple RNA polymerases. Well, we don't see them, but we can infer their position. We see multiple messenger RNA molecules coming off of this DNA gene through these polymerases that are in different stages of transcription. Just beautiful, beautiful imagery. Part of the reason for this simultaneous transcription is that transcription actually occurs quite slow, especially as compared to replication. Transcription proceeds at about 30 bases per second. But this decrease in speed for RNA synthesis is compensated by simultaneous transcription. So really the name of the game here is how much RNA can you make per unit time? Well, you can't make so much RNA with a single polymerase because it moves quite slow. But if you have multiple polymerases on a gene in a single time, then you're making that much more RNA. These RNA polymerases, like any RNA polymerase, can initiate transcription without a primer. Remember, that's the power of primase in DNA replication, is that we have to make an RNA primer before we synthesize DNA. So we can always make RNA without a primer. RNA polymerases do have a higher error rate than we're used to seeing before. They make about one mistake in every 10,000 bases transcribed. But this is okay because RNAs are relatively short-lived. So if you make a mistake in the RNA, you make a mutant RNA molecule. You're going to make mutant protein from that, sure, but eventually that RNA is going to decay, and you won't make that mutant protein anymore. So mutant proteins made from mutant RNAs are transient. If you pick up a mutation in the, D in the DNA itself, every single messenger RNA you make from that gene will be mutant, and every single protein you make moving forward from that gene will be mutant. Not the case with errors in RNA. The RNA is short-lived, the proteins that are made from that RNA are short-lived, and so these effects are fairly transient. We're going to focus on what's called messenger RNA, but it's important to take a slide or two just to point out the different types of RNA that a cell can make. Most genes in a genome are protein coding, and so gene expression usually results in protein synthesis. The RNAs that are transcribed from protein coding genes are middlemen. These are RNAs that are in between the DNA gene and the final protein. They are passing the information from DNA to the protein, and so they're called messenger RNAs, because literally they're carrying the message from the DNA gene to the protein synthesis machinery. So we call them mRNAs. But there are some other RNAs that a cell makes, and these tend to be more functional RNAs. Here, when you transcribe these non-protein coding genes, the RNA is the endpoint. It's the RNA that does the process the cell needs. And so these RNAs are not translated. Proteins are not made from them. They're not the middlemen. And so gene expression of these genes simply means transcription and ends at transcription because it's the RNA that the cell wants. These non-coding, non-messenger RNAs can have regulatory functions. That means that the RNA itself regulates other genes. They can have structural functions. The RNA itself plays a role in, in the structure of the cell. And as we've already alluded to, they can have catalytic functions where the RNA itself folds into a three-dimensional shape and that shape has some function. Some examples of these non-messenger RNAs are ribosomal RNAs. Ribosomal RNAs, or rRNAs, become part of the protein synth synthesis machinery itself. Ribosomal RNAs become part of the ribosome, which is responsible for translation. The genes for making ribosomal RNAs are found in our genome. Those genes are transcribed. They're copied into RNAs. But those RNAs are never translated because they're not protein coding. The RNAs are made for the RNA's sake. Those RNAs go and join the ribosome and assist in translation. This is still gene expression. Those ribosomal genes in the genome have been expressed. RNAs have been made from them. But the expression stops at the RNA level. You might remember that these ribosomal genes are those that are clustered together in the nucleolus of the cell. We've talked about these very briefly before. There are also transfer RNAs, tRNAs, that are also 
uh, play an integral role in protein synthesis, which we'll talk about in our next lecture. There are microRNAs, miRNAs, that do tons of just mind-boggling, amazing things. And there are also others as well. So this table, Table 1 from Chapter 7, just lists these different types of RNAs and says very briefly what they do. But today we're talking about protein synthesis, we're talking about messenger RNAs, and so let's focus the rest of our conversation here on how we transcribe messenger RNAs and what they do in a cell. So we're going to begin talking first about what goes on in prokaryotes, how transcription is started in prokaryotes, and then we'll move to the slightly more complicated story of our cells, of eukaryotic cells. So we'll have to just be patient and put our agreed-upon narcissism aside for a moment to talk about bacteria. Eukaryotic transcription and bacterial transcription have a great deal in common. But because the process is simpler in bacteria, it's easier to kind of get the basics down using prokaryotic systems, and then we'll go on and talk about eukaryotic cells and add some of the complexity. For most biological processes, the hardest thing to do is start the thing. Most biological processes are repetitive. You do the same thing over and over again. So once you get into that repetitive mode, it's quite simple for the cell to just keep chugga-chugging through whatever it is it's doing. It's getting the signals right to start these processes. That's hard, and, and transcription is no exception to that. Also, starting processes, and transcription certainly is no exception to this either, is, is a wonderful point of regulation. What we mean by that is, if you don't need to make a protein, block transcription. Stop transcription of that gene from starting. If that gene can't be transcribed, then there's no messenger RNA to translate, and protein will never be made. So if the hardest part is starting, then that's the easiest part to block, because it's the hardest part to do, if that makes any sense. Anyway, the very first challenge that any RNA polymerase has is actually finding the damn gene. Remember, all DNA is just DNA. DNA is nothing more than chains and sequences of A's and C's and G's and T's. So where in that chain, where in that chromosome, is the gene that you need to transcribe? RNA polymerases have a general weak affinity for DNA. RNA polymerases have some positive charges associated with them. Remember, DNA is negative. So there is a weak attraction between DNA and RNA polymerases. What that means is when an RNA polymerase collides with a DNA molecule, it's going to stick to that molecule, but it doesn't like it enough to stay put. So it sticks to the phosphate sugar backbone of the DNA, but it starts moving. The RNA polymerase starts scanning and it's scanning the DNA for a particular sequence. When the RNA polymerase stumbles upon the sequence that it's looking for, it stops scanning and it binds tightly. These sequences that RNA polymerases bind to, specifically and tightly, are called promoters, because these sequences promote gene expression. So here's an example of a bacterial promoter. Um, really, all that we're interested here in this schematic is that the start site of transcription is right here, and the RNA polymerase is going to bind just upstream of that, just in front of that, to this promoter. And although I'll never hold you responsible for this at all, this region here at minus 10 and this region here at minus 35, these are the specific sequences in green that the RNA polymerase binds to. So promoters lie immediately upstream of genes, the DNA is pulled apart at the promoter, making that DNA single-stranded, exposing the template strand for transcription. And so we make our transcription bubble right here at the promoter. So we go from scanning mode of the polymerase in blue to opening mode, the polymerase here in blue, happening right here at the promoter. Once we get that transcription bubble formed, the RNA polymerase is going to transcribe. It's going to build that single strand of RNA using the template strand of DNA as a guide, and it's going to keep doing that and keep doing that until the polymerase encounters another specific sequence that we call a terminator. No big mystery in what the terminator does. It's going to terminate transcription and stop the process at the end of the gene. So polymerase ends transcription at the terminator. The polymerase lets go of the DNA. It also lets go of the newly minted RNA, which then it can go off and be used for translation. So that's shown here. Once the RNA polymerase transcribes the terminator, uh, complicated cellular signals occur, but we won't go into those at all, but those cause the RNA polymerase to let go of the DNA, let go of the RNA, and everybody's gone back to where they were when they started. In bacteria, 
what allows RNA polymerases to bind specifically to that promoter is a separate pro protein called sigma factor. So in bacteria, sigma factor, this is the Greek letter sigma here, sigma factor is directly responsible for recognizing and binding the polymerase to the promoter. But sigma factor loves that promoter sequence. So if sigma factor never let go of the rest of polymerase, it would be as though polymerase was an angry, angry dog on the end of a leash, constantly trying to move forward but never being allowed to. So once transcription has started and been stably initiated, sigma factor must let go of that leash. Sigma factor must disassociate with RNA polymerase, allowing the polymerase to continue down the gene. So now with all those pieces in place, we can kind of look at this schematic as one big story. RNA polymerase, along with sigma factor, collided with this DNA molecule way, way back here somewhere and just moved along at scanning, scanning, scanning. What was really responsible for the scanning was sigma factor. Once sigma factor came upon that specific promoter DNA sequence, it bound there tightly and locked that polymerase down. That ends the scanning mode. Other subunits of the polymerase then pull the DNA apart at that promoter, exposing the single strand of DNA. RNA is made using that single strand as a guide, and once that RNA has become stably made, it's about 10 nucleotides long, once the polymerase has strung together about 10 nucleotides, it tries to move forward, it would like to move forward, but sigma's holding it back. At that point, sigma factor lets go of the DNA, releasing the RNA polymerase from the promoter. Now the RNA polymerase flies down that gene, transcribing as it goes, opening that transcription bubble as it goes, until finally it transcribes the termination sequence. The termination sequence causes the RNA polymerase to let go. The RNA is let go from that process as well. And once that RNA polymerase is free, sigma factor reassociates with it so that this whole complex can collide with a new DNA molecule and repeat, repeat the process at some other gene. So no DNA sequence without a promoter can ever be transcribed. A promoter is the most critical portion of a gene. But if a gene has a promoter, it can be copied. And this is regardless of the strand that it's on. So we have two strands of DNA. All DNA is double-stranded. And there can be and there are genes on both strands. There are genes on the bottom strand going in one direction, genes on the top strand going in the other direction. But each of those genes must and always has a promoter. Without a promoter, you are not a gene, and you cannot be transcribed. So that's the bacterial story. Pretty straightforward. Now let's go to eukaryotes. The story's a little bit more complicated in our cells, simply because everything is so much harder in our cells. So let's start off then by highlighting how transcription in our cells is different from transcription in bacteria. First of all, we have three RNA polymerases, not just one. They're called RNA polymerase 1, 2, and 3, of course. And each of these RNA polymerases is responsible for the transcription of different types of RNA. RNA polymerase 1 and 3 are used for the RNA genes. These are the genes that gene expression ends with an RNA molecule, the tRNAs, the ribosomal RNAs, the microRNAs, etc. RNA polymerase 2 is used for the protein coding genes. No other RNA polymerase transcribes protein coding genes except RNA polymerase 2. Another difference is that our RNA polymerases cannot initiate transcription by themselves. They require a whole set of additional protein complexes to start the process of transcription. These other additional proteins needed for our transcriptional initiation are referred to as general transcription factors, or GTFs. And transcription of eukaryotic cells cannot happen without these GTFs. In fact, when the RNA polymerase II from eukaryotic cells was first discovered, it was discovered in yeast, it was purified so that only RNA polymerase II was obtained by scientists, and they threw it in a tube with a whole bunch of genes, and nothing happened. And for quite a long time, scientists could not figure out why, if they had, if they had purified the RNA polymerase machinery, they couldn't get transcription in a test tube. And the reason was because they didn't have the general transcription factors as well. Once the GTFs were purified and added to that reaction, everything worked. GTFs assemble at a genes promoter along with RNA polymerase II, and together all of these proteins form what is called a pre-initiation complex, or a PIC. Since the process in eukaryotic cells is much more complicated, that allows for much more regulation. Sometimes complexity is not a curse, but a blessing.
The more steps there are to a process, the more each of those steps can be fine-tuned and regulated. And for the, the sake of protein synthesis, where the protein production really means cellular function, the more steps for regulation and fine-tuning, the better. But we'll talk about that regulation after exam one. The final difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic transcription is that eukaryotic transcription has to deal with chromatin and nucleosomes. Remember, all of our DNA is wrapped up into chromatin. And so that's a pretty major hassle, having to transcribe through all of these nucleosomes, all of this nucleosomal DNA. But that, too, we'll expand on much later in the course. So let's move on to the general transcription factors themselves. The general transcription factors are responsible for recruiting RNA polymerase to the promoter. The GTFs correctly position that RNA polymerase at the promoter. They also separate double-stranded DNA to single-stranded, forming the transcription bubble. And finally, it's the GTFs that launch the polymerase down the gene for transcription to occur. All GTFs are named in a similar way. They all start with TF, which stands for transcription factor. Following that is a Roman numeral 1, 2, or 3, which denotes the RNA polymerase that that transcription factor associates with. So the GTFs for RNA polymerase 1 would be called TF1. And then finally, they all end with a single letter, which is just arbitrary and identifies one complex from another. For RNA polymerase 2, all the GTFs are called TF2 something. And the first GTF to recognize and bind directly to the promoter is TF2D, transcription factor for RNA polymerase 2, named D. TF2D is a complex made up of many different proteins, and one of those proteins is called Tata binding protein, or TBP. So TBP is a single protein, which is a member of the larger complex TF2D. TBP binds to DNA directly. In fact, it's the only member of the GTFs that can directly bind to DNA. TBP binds to the promoter of the eukaryotic gene. Eukaryotic promoters have a specific sequence, and these sequences are very rich in thymines and adenines. For example, one common uh, promoter sequence in eukaryotes is TATAAT. And they're usually found about 25 bases upstream of the actual transcription start site. Because of this sequence, because of this richness in adenines and thymines, promoter sequences in eukaryotes are called Tata boxes. And that's where TBP gets its name. Tata binding protein binds to these Tata boxes. I'd like you to take just a quick moment and think about why promoters have this particular type of sequence. How many hydrogen bonds between G and C? Three. How many hydrogen bonds between A and T? Two. So in the Velcro analogy of DNA, the Velcro holding T's to A's is actually just a little bit weaker than the Velcro holding together G's and C's. That means it's easier to pull DNA apart when it's rich in A's and T's because there are fewer hydrogen bonds. It's harder to pull DNA apart when it's rich in G's and C's. So promoters, much like origins of replication, are very rich in adenines and thymines because these are the weakest interactions and the easiest to pull apart. In any event, when TBP binds to the promoter, it actually bends or kinks the DNA 90 degrees. This is what TBP looks like when it binds to DNA. TBP is shown at the top in green and blue. The DNA itself is orange. You can see the Tata sequence there, T-A-T-A-A-A in this case. TBP binds to that sequence directly, and when it binds the DNA, it bends that DNA. It almost hurts to look at. Look at that DNA being distorted. In this case, it's bent a little bit more than 90 degrees. It's quite a severe kink. This change in the DNA topology, this very severe kink in the DNA, unmistakably marks the promoter as a promoter for all of the other GTFs to come in and bind. So following TF2D, of which TBP is part, the next GTF to bind to associate with this complex is actually not shown on this schematic, but it's TF2A. Following TF2A comes TF2B, and then comes the RNA polymerase itself. So RNA polymerase joins the complex at that part. One of the subunits on RNA polymerase itself is TF2F. Following TF2F is TF2E. And the last GTF to bind this complex is TF2H. So the order of assembly of the GTFs is DAB, then the polymerase itself, and then FEH.
The most helpful mnemonic I've come up with for myself to remember this is the word dabfe. If you can remember the word dabfe in its two syllables, you have memorized the order of assembly for the GTFs. D-A-B, space for the polymerase itself, F-E-H. Now, interestingly, much like histone proteins, RNA polymerase 2 has a tail. This is an end of the amino acid sequence of RNA polymerase 2 that projects away from the, the nuts and bolts of that enzyme. So this is an end of its amino acid chain that is accessible and modifiable. In this case, the end is the carboxy terminal end of the protein. That is the true end of the amino acid sequence, the, the last amino acids in the chain. The tails of the histone proteins were actually the amino terminal ends. That's the very, very beginning of the amino acid chain. But it doesn't matter. It's the end of the amino acid sequence that's kind of hanging out there loose and is accessible. The carboxy terminal tail, or carboxy terminal domain, CTD, of RNA polymerase 2 can be phosphorylated. You might remember phosphorylation as one of the modifications that were done to histones as well. This phosphorylation of the tail of RNA polymerase represents a type of code synonymous to the histone code we discussed before. The tail of RNA polymerase is phosphorylated at specific places at specific times, which signal what state of transcription the enzyme is involved in. For example, the tail is phosphorylated at specific sequences to signal that it should be released from the promoter. The GTF-TF2H is responsible for this phosphorylation. So you can see we begin with the promoter-bound RNA polymerase, and then a phosphorylation on that tail releases it from the promoter and allows it to be initiating. Other phosphorylations signal that now the RNA polymerase is in the middle of transcribing, and yet more phosphorylations symbolize that the RNA polymerase is done with its transcription and should be terminated. Once RNA polymerase 2 is successfully done transcribing, most of the general transcription factors dissociate from the promoter, and they recycle. They're ready to be bound to other promoters and assist with another round of transcription there. Part of the recycling of RNA polymerase 2 itself is removing all of those phosphates, returning RNA polymerase to its unphosphorylated form. Only the unphosphorylated form, the clean slate of RNA polymerase 2, can be recruited to a promoter and begin the process of transcription. So we're done. We've transcribed our gene. We've made our messenger RNA. We're ready for translation. Not even close. We've only started the process. Just because we've made a messenger RNA doesn't mean we're anywhere near being finished with that messenger RNA. As a general rule, if it's happening in our cells, it's a very complex affair. For bacteria, yeah, sure, it is that simple. We are done. Newly transcribed, finished messenger RNAs are immediately bound by ribosomes and translated in bacterial cells. No break in the chain of the central dogma. Remember, bacteria have no nuclei. That's the defining characteristic of prokaryotes. Everything is kind of in that big soup of the cytoplasm together. So, once a gene is transcribed and a messenger RNA is made, ribosomes are sitting right there, ready to translate it. But we're eukaryotes. We do have nuclei. Our ribosomes are not in the nucleus, but transcription occurs in the nucleus. So the messenger RNA, which was just made in the nucleus, has to leave the nucleus and be exported into the cytoplasm in order for translation to be possible. This, what seems to be a hassle, is actually great. It allows for quality control. Our cells actually have the opportunity to inspect and check their newly synthesized messenger RNAs before those RNAs are used for translation. What allows this is the compartmentalization of the cell. One process occurs in the nucleus. The next process occurs in the cytoplasm. As part of this process of quality control, messenger RNAs must be processed. These processing things, these processing events, include additions made to the beginning, 5' prime end of the messenger RNA, and additions made to the end, 3' prime end of the messenger RNA. These additions to both sides of the messenger RNA are the cell's stamp of approval that the messenger RNA has been complete, it's been correctly synthesized. Only messenger RNAs with these stamps of approval, with these additions, can export the nucleus and be used for translation. And the enzymes responsible for these additions, 
They ride on the carboxyterminal tail of RNA polymerase too. They go along for the transcription ride, and they make these modifications in real time. And so here, on the very large tail of RNA polymerase, that same tail that is phosphorylated, we see factors for capping, which we'll talk about in just a second. We see factors for splicing. We see factors for polyadenylation. These are the three processes that happen to messenger RNAs before translation. And the enzymes, the proteins needed for all of them, track right along with the back of the RNA polymerase II and can uh, complete these processes in real time as the messenger RNA is made. So as the beginning 5' end of the messenger RNA comes out of the back of RNA polymerase, who hops on it? The capping enzyme, putting a 5' cap. And these other factors needed for later modifications are also there, ready to access the RNA as soon as it's made. So the very first thing that happens to a messenger RNA is this 5' cap. <coughs> the 5' cap is really nothing more than a slightly weirdo base. This is a methylated guanine that's attached to the 5' end of the messenger RNA in a very atypical way. It's kind of popped on upside down. And we take a closer look. We see here's the methyl group on this guanine. Here's the ribose sugar. No problem there. But look, we have all three phosphates kept. You know, usually we chop two of those three phosphates off, right? Here all three phosphates are still there. And we've been attached to the 5' end in this kind of upside-down orientation. So 5' end to 5' end, rather than 3' end to 5' end. So it's just a, a methylated guanine that's been put on upside down, essentially. What's the importance of the 5' cap? Well, it marks the beginning of the messenger RNA, and more importantly, it marks it as genuine. It's the cell's way of saying, this 5' end of this messenger RNA, this is a real 5' end. This molecule hasn't been broken, it hasn't been severed. This really is the start of this molecule. RNAs also receive, messenger RNAs also receive, a poly-A tail. This is the polyadenylation. The poly-A tail is usually hundreds and hundreds of adenines long. It's all it is. It's a run of adenine bases, and nothing but adenine bases, added to a messenger RNA's 3' end. And so here we see the RNA coming out of the back of the RNA polymerase. Near the end of that is a poly-A signal. The RNA is actually cut at this site, and this long, long tail of nothing but A's is added to the back end, the end of the messenger RNA. All of the enzymes necessary for that also track along on the carboxy terminal domain of the polymerase. This process of polyadenylation requires a bunch of different enzymes, all of which track along with the polymerase. And the point of the poly A tail is to mark the end of the messenger RNA as genuine. It's the same idea, the cell's way of saying, this really is the end of this messenger RNA. This RNA hasn't been chopped in half. This isn't some exposed end due to some breakdown of the molecule. This is the real, genuine end of this messenger RNA. So what these two modifications do together is they certify that the messenger RNA is whole. If you've got a cap, you've got the real beginning. If you've got a tail, you've got the real end. Any messenger RNA with a cap and a tail is whole and hasn't been cut. These two modifications also result in the messenger RNA being allowed to leave the nucleus. It certifies that it's ready for translation. Finally, they mark the messenger RNA as a messenger RNA. Transfer RNAs, ribosomal RNAs, microRNAs, they don't have 5' caps and poly A tails. And so if a molecule of RNA has those two modifications, it is a messenger RNA, and the cell knows that it must be translated. In other words, these modifications tell the cellular machinery, hey, I'm meant to be translated. I'm meant to be turned into protein. Finally, Proteins recruited to the 5' cap, so these are proteins that bind specifically to 5' caps, and proteins that bind specifically to poly A tails interact with one another. The implication there, the result of that, is that messenger RNAs circularize. The cap interacts with the tail. This circularization, more than any other cellular signal, tells a cell that it's dealing with a good, fully processed, fully intact, non-broken messenger RNA. All right, but we're still not done. The most important process we haven't even scratched the surface of yet. Most eukaryotic MNA, mRNAs are chopped up into little pieces and then stitched back together again. And I'll say it again. Most of our RNAs, 
need to be cut into pieces and glued back together before we make protein. That's because our RNAs are interrupted quite regularly with sequences that are non-coding and are not involved in translation. Just amazing and simultaneously frightening. So all of our genes on our chromosomes have their protein coding sequences interrupted. And they're interrupted by quite long intervening sequences that don't code for anything. And these are called introns. These intervening sequences that don't code for protein are introns. And here we see a fairly accurate schematic of a eukaryotic gene. This is the gene on the DNA, so it's double-stranded. And we see all these pale brown introns, non-coding. This is to be contrasted against a bacterial gene. Bacteria don't have introns. And so for a bacterial gene, what you see is what codes. A bacterial gene is the coding region, period, and you make a protein from it. That's the case for us. In our cells, introns can range from single nucleotides in length to 10,000 nucleotides. 10,000 nucleotide interruption of a non-coding region that's just there in the way. The actual coding sequences, the things that actually matter, the parts of the gene that are in the instructions for an amino acid chain, those are exons. Exons are down here in darker brown. Most genes, believe it or not, are more introns than exons. Most of the sequence of a gene is more non-coding than coding. It's crazy. These are two human genes drawn to scale. The human beta globin gene, this is important for hemoglobin, all right, maybe about 50-50. Three exons in red, one, two, three, with introns in between. No big deal. Human factor eight, this is a blood clotting factor. Look at this, crazy. 26 exons, they're in red. The red regions are the coding regions. The schematic is to scale. Everything that's in orange is not needed, is intervening, is junk that's in the way, and it all has to be chopped out. Look at some of these exons are so small, and the intervening sequences are ridiculously big. It's just insane. Both introns and exons are transcribed into messenger RNA. The introns and exons are encoded on the DNA, and they're both transcribed. The reason for this is simply because RNA polymerases, they can't discriminate <coughs> between coding and non-coding DNA sequences. RNA polymerase doesn't know what an intron is and an exon is. And so RNA polymerase transcribes both. Then, after transcription, all the functional coding exons need to be joined together and all the intervening non-functional non-coding introns need to be removed this is done through a process called splicing splicing results in the introns being removed and the exons being stitched together so in blue here are the exons and the introns are in between in orange we need to get rid of all this crap in between and take the blue regions and stitch them together so how is that done how do we splice RNA? To the limit of our understanding, most introns are junk DNA. Most intron sequences are molecular gibberish. The sequence appears to be random. The reason why I say to the limit of our understanding is who knows what we'll know 50 years from now. Perhaps introns contain a host of important information that cells need to have. But at this point, it seems as though that's not the case. What all introns do share, however, is are very, very limited but critically important conserved sequences at their two ends, at their 5' prime and 3' prime end, and a little bit of conserved sequence in the middle. When I say conserved sequence, I mean these are sequences that are nearly identical in all introns found, regardless of how long they are or where they are, what genes they interrupt. All introns contain these very limited but highly conserved, highly similar sequences at their ends and in their middle. So we go back to this diagram, and truly what we mean is all introns have a GU purine AGU sequence at their 5' prime end have a run of pyrimidines, that's what the Ys represent, any base, and then CAG at their 3' prime end, and somewhere in the middle they have this conserved sequence of which the most important is this A in red, this adenine in red. All introns share these sequences. What's in between them? Complete gibberish. Complete random sequence. You can put whatever you want in between there. But you must, to be a spliceable intron, have these three regions at the beginning, in your middle, and at your end. These very limited but conserved sequences, they serve as molecular cues for removal. It, are the, it, are, it is these sequences that allow 
introns to be spliced out. So using these sequences as a guide, a very complex machine called a spliceosome removes introns out and ligates the intervening exons together, does the chopping out and gluing of uh, intron removal. Now, I say here it's a protein machine, the spliceosome, and then I say here it's largely made of RNA. Both of those are true. The spliceosome, like the ribosome, is actually a huge conglomeration of functional RNAs and proteins that work together to remove introns. If this were an upper-level class dedicated to molecular biology or a grad course, we would go through all the steps of intron removal. Since this is a hybrid cell and molecular biology class, we won't go into this in any great detail, but I would like you to appreciate the simple things that we see are happening here, which is that one of these RNA protein complexes binds to the conserved sequence at the 5' prime end of the intron. One binds to that conserved sequence in the middle. A few more bind to the conserved sequence at the 3' prime end. And then there's a lot of chopping. Chop, glue, chop, chop, and when you're done, exons glued together, and intron removed. This is the spliceosome. In essence, really the only mechanism you need to know for this class is that the freed 3' prime end of the intron, it attaches to that A in the middle, that conserved A in the middle of the intron. When that 5' prime end connects up to that A, we've actually made our first severing. So we see that here in this diagram. This A in the middle of the intron attacks or cuts the 5' prime end of the intron. We form this loop as a result. And then we have the second cut at this exon right here, gluing the two exons together and releasing this circularized intron. This is called a lariat. A lariat is kind of like a lasso, and so this resembles a lariat structure. This lariat is the intron, and the intron is garbage at this point. What's important is that the exons have been glued together. My god, what a hassle, right? Why in the world would we do this? What's the point? Also keep in mind that every time an NTP is added onto the end of an RNA being synthesized, we've burned the equivalent of a single ATP. The cells work so hard to make and save ATP. Energy is the currency of the cell. Energy is like money to the cell. And the cell works so hard to save all this energy, and then it's going to burn so much of it, making RNA sequences that it doesn't need. So there is some evidence that introns are simply ancient mobile elements. Hopefully you remember transposons and mobile elements that we talked about a few lectures ago. There's some evidence that introns are nothing more than long-lasting relics of ancient but extinct viral infections that hit a eukaryotic cell long, long ago in our evolutionary history. There's some evidence for that, but it's not very convincing. There's some evidence that introns are with us from the very beginning of our evolutionary story because they serve as a kind of mm, decoy for mutations, a genetic magnet for mutations that allows the more important sequences to be unmutated and healthy. It's more just this sense of if the vast, vast majority of your genome is this quote-unquote junk DNA, and mutations land randomly on that DNA. If most of the DNA is junk, then most of the mutations mutate junk. And so you kind of bias mutations away from being important. There's some evidence for that, but it's not convincing. The truth of the matter is we really still don't understand why we have introns, and why they persist, and evolutionarily why they don't leave our genome. But we do fully understand one important benefit of having them, and that's the concept of alternative splicing. You see, one benefit of introns, and perhaps the most critical selective pressure to keep them, evolutionarily speaking, is this phenomenon of, or, of alternative splicing. There's no hard, fast cellular rule that says all of your exons have to be kept. In other words, you can splice together non-adjacent exons, and when you do that, you will delete some of the exons that are in between. By doing this, you make new proteins. In fact, many different proteins with different sequences of their amino acids and therefore different shapes that they fold into and therefore, most importantly, different functions can be made from a single gene through alternative splicing.
Up here we have what's called the pre-mRNA transcript. This is the exact copy of the gene from the DNA. <clears throat> and in pink here we have the introns. The exons are color-coded red, blue, green, and purple. There's nothing to say that you have to keep all of these exons. Sure, this processed RNA down here does keep all the exons. We see the red, the blue, the green, and the purple all together. But you could splice out this entire region, including the red, and be left with a transcript that is blue, green, purple. You could go red, blue, purple by splicing from this 5' prime end of this intron all the way to this 3' prime end of this intron. You can remove the blue exon by splicing from here to here, giving you this transcript. You could splice off the end and lose the purple exon. My god, you could even splice from here to here, keeping the blue with the green and get rid of the rest, giving you a very small transcript. Each of these transcripts, alternatively spliced, will give rise to a different amino acid sequence, giving rise to a protein that folds in a different way, giving rise to proteins that do different things. It's believed that about 60% of our genome can be alternatively spliced. This greatly increases what I think of as our protein potential. It greatly increases the variability and potential pool of proteins we can make. Splicing also results in protein synthesis being quite a bit more modular. What I mean by this is if exons individually encode individual modules of protein function. So what am I talking about? What I mean is if each exon kind of carries its own limited cellular function. For example, ATPase. ATPase domains are responsible for cutting ATP molecules and releasing energy. If you have an exon that is its own little self-contained individual ATPase module, you can give a protein ATPS activity by keeping that exon, and you can remove ATPase activity from a proton protein by splicing out that exon. So if exons are restricted to encoding individual modules of protein function, then exons can be spliced out and left in, and even traded between genes, to give proteins functions or take those functions away. This on the bottom is a protein that we don't necessarily need to understand or talk about in its detail, but it's a protein like most others that contains multiple domains. We have a domain here that stops it from binding to DNA. Those are these regions here. Other segments of this protein, these are just portions of its amino acid sequence, but other segments of this protein regulate the interaction of this protein with DNA and also have some phosphorylation roles. These domains here, called homeobinding domains, or homeodomains, are involved in DNA binding and DNA bending, also localize this protein to the nucleus. And then here we have other repression domains, activation domains, etc., etc. The real take-home message here is that this single protein is divided into multiple individual domains, and each of those protein domains carry their own specific function. By having alternative splicing, the idea is if each of these domains is, in, is encoded by an individual exon, if we want to get rid of this homeodomain region, we could splice the transcript for this protein from here all the way to here, which would result in a protein that's, trans, that's synthesized from here directly to here, removing the domains in between. This is probably the power of introns, through this process called alternative splicing. This modulization of proteins allows single genes to make proteins that are related to one another but carry out individual functions, specific functions, dictated by the exons that were kept and the exons that were removed. The analogy here is one of these KitchenAid mixers. My wife is a big cook. Cooking is probably her most favorite hobby. So we have one of these KitchenAids at home and they're just amazingly versatile. 
They're really made to stir up bread dough. I think that's why they were invented. But they've made it so that you can pop on all of these attachments. And you can make it make ice cream. It can make pasta. It becomes a food grinder, a citrus juicer, grain mill. You can read through these. But each of these is a different accessory. You could think of each of these as an individual domain, providing this KitchenAid with an individual function. So if you want to be a citrus juicer, you would keep the Exxon allowing you to build the citrus juicing accessory. You want to make a different protein that doesn't juice citrus but makes pasta? Well, leave that Exxon out, splice that Exxon out, and leave in the Exxon that allows you to make the pasta maker domain. And so this is a kind of modular way to switch out proteins. Are they all related? Sure, they're all based on the same general structure, right? They all need this motor, this engine to power them. So they're all from the same gene, but they have individualized function because of the exons that are left in compared to the exons that are removed. Okay, so let's wrap it all up then and kind of come home with some major concepts. Hopefully, as you can see, transcription itself was the easy part. Once transcription was done, and even during transcription itself, the messenger RNAs were checked for their quality. They were capped on their 5' prime end. They were given their poly A tails, and they were spliced. Only the messenger RNAs that survived all of these processes intact are allowed to leave the nucleus for translation. Only mRNAs that have been fully processed can be translated into protein. And that allows for some really in-depth quality control. In fact, transport across the nuclear membrane is highly selective and highly regulated, period. Not just for messenger RNAs, for everything. Nothing leaves or enters the nucleus without not being fully vetted for its integrity. The gatekeepers of the nucleus are called the nuclear pore complexes. Nothing leaves or enters the nucleus without going through one of these nuclear pore complexes. When it comes to messenger RNAs, the nuclear pore complex only allows mRNAs out into the cytoplasm for translation if they have specific proteins bound to the cap, bound to the splice junctions between the individual exons, and bound to the tail. So a fully processed, fully intact messenger RNA will have cap binding proteins, tail binding proteins, and exon junction complexes. Only a messenger RNA with these types of proteins on it will be threaded through the nuclear pore complex from the nucleus into the cytoplasm. Once in the cytoplasm, those proteins can leave or be exchanged for others. But what's important is that these proteins on the messenger RNA in the nucleus, by their mere presence, certify that the messenger RNA has been capped, has been tailed, and has been spliced. All of the other RNAs, the unlucky ones, the ones that were broken, the intron lariats that were spliced out, mutant transcripts that failed quality control tests, they don't get to leave. They don't have the right proteins bound to them, they don't go through the nuclear pore complex, they remain in the nucleus, and in the nucleus they are degraded, they are destroyed. The individual nucleotides themselves are recycled and used in subsequent rounds of transcription to make new RNAs, but those RNA molecules themselves, those chains of nucleotides, they're destroyed. Now, all RNAs are destroyed sooner or later. Even the good ones that get to leave are going to be degraded. To halt protein synthesis, there's no more potent mechanism than destroying the RNA. Remember, we said a good point for regulation was making the RNA. You don't want to make the protein. Don't transcribe the gene. Well, another good place for protein regulation is destroying that RNA if you've already made it. Once that RNA is gone, you can't make that protein anymore. You almost can imagine the cell taunting itself. Yeah, you need to make that protein. How are you going to make it now? Because that messenger RNA has been destroyed. No big surprise that the levels of protein synthesized closely correlate to the lifetime of the RNA. What we mean by that is RNAs that stick around in a cell for a long time tend to have those proteins made from the RNA in high number. RNAs with very, very short lifetime tend to make proteins that are present in low levels. Eukaryotic RNA, RNAs have lifetimes that can range from a few minutes to days. And we're truly talking about 10 minutes to half a week. And these RNA lifetimes are controlled by RNA sequences that are found on the 3' prime end of the messenger RNA. In fact, these sequences are well past the actual protein, protein coding region. Because these sequences are not involved in translation, 
they are called untranslated regions. And so these kind of mRNA lifetime regulation regions are called 3' UTRs for the 3' un untranslated region of the messenger RNA. We don't have to focus on the details here. I'm just giving you the lay of the land. But we have our 5' cap. We have our poly A tail. We've got our coding region in between that the ribosome is going to use for translation. Lots of other things are going on that we don't need to worry about so much. But here, in between the end of the protein coding region itself, but before the poly A tail, are our 3' UTR elements. And proteins bind to these 3' UTR sequences, and depending on what protein binds there, which depends on the sequence itself, the RNA is either short-lived or long-lived. This is a type of evolutionary regulatory fine-tuning where we can really get the process down just right. We, well, we need that protein a little bit more. We need it a little bit longer. Well, we'll make it so that RNA lasts a little bit longer in the cell. We need that protein. We need it right now, but we don't need it quite as much as you've made it. We don't need it for quite as long as it's being made. Well, we'll evolve the 3' UTR so that different proteins bind and that RNA is a little bit less long-lived. Regardless of the type of RNA, regardless of its lifetime, its quality, or its function, all RNAs are degraded at some point. All of those RNAs are recycled, and they're broken down and degraded by enzymes called RNases, and this happens when their function is no longer needed. So to summarize what we talked about today, we started by just the general idea that transcription is nothing more than the process of copying a DNA gene into an RNA molecule. And because DNA and RNA are of the same nucleotide language, we truly are, are transcribing a gene. When the information that's contained within a gene has been manifested, we have said that the gene has been expressed. Now for protein coding genes, it's a two-step process of transcription and translation, and the gene manifests as protein. Other genes are just making RNA as an endpoint. In either case, we have the ability for amplification where we can make many, many RNAs and subsequently, if necessary, many, many proteins from a single RNA gene, a uh, single DNA gene. <coughs> Transcription in its basics closely resembles replication, but there are some differences which we went through. RNA polymerases are the enzymes responsible for transcription. We talked about some of the different types of RNAs, messenger RNAs, ribosomal RNAs, transfer RNAs, microRNAs. And then we just began discussing the actual process of transcription itself. In prokaryotes and in eukaryotes, genes start with promoters. Promoters mark the beginning of a gene for transcription. Transcription then proceeds from the promoter all the way through the gene until the polymerase encounters another specific sequence that's called the terminator. And this sequence signals the stop or termination of transcription. In our cells, we need general transcription factors to help our RNA polymerases initiate transcription. We didn't talk about the GTFs for RNA polymerase 1 or RNA polymerase 3, but for RNA polymerase 2, the RNA polymerase that transcribes protein coding genes, the GTFs assemble in the DABFE order. TF2D, which includes the TBP Tata binding protein, TF2A, TF2B, then the polymerase itself, TF2F, TF2E, and TF2H. Eukaryotic promoters are called Tata boxes because they're rich in Ts and As, and they are bound by TF2H, which includes the TBP subunit. We also said that TF2H is responsible for the phosphorylation of the RNA polymerase tail, which releases it from the promoter. And so the RNA polymerase 2 tail can be phosphorylated, but not only to release it from the promoter, but to serve as a code for many other cellular processes, such as I'm in the beginning of transcription, I'm in the middle of transcription, or I've terminated transcription. Eukaryotic mRNAs are processed. They receive a 5' cap, which is an upside-down methylated guanine. They receive a poly A tail through the process of polyadenylation, and they are spliced. So functional, mature messenger RNAs made in our cells that are all coding that contain nothing but coding sequences are made through splicing. Splicing involves the removal of introns and the stitching together of exons. This is done by the spliceosome. Finally, we ended with a short conversation on alternative splicing. Alternative splicing skips over some exons, splicing non-adjacent exons together. This creates new proteins, often in a modular fashion, which have new sequences of amino acids and therefore new uh, 
or novel functions. This allows us to make many more proteins than we have genes. We can make related proteins, but with different specific functions, which adds a whole new level of power to the human genome. This wouldn't be possible without introns, and is probably a selective pressure for keeping them. So that wraps up transcription. We're going to finish Chapter 7 in the next lecture, which is translation. We'll go through how proteins are actually made from messenger RNAs, and then that'll wrap, wrap up the first unit of the semester.